介绍了。但是呢，我希望 highlight a few things。呃，对了，对他的尊重，下面我想用英语讲几句哈。So Professor Bahalis is a professor who is very difficult not to recognize, right? So who we don't know,、uh, we will say Professor Bahalis doesn't need the introduction. Am I right? <laughs> anyway, and also he is one of the most cited authors with 35 citations and H index of 81. Am I right? Great. Anyway, and also he has been serving on the IFID board, which is the Information and Technology for Travel and Tourism. He has always been very active in teaching and learning innovation. And more importantly, I think he has made a lot of his recent research to the industry and the practitioners' relevance. Meaning, he has answered a lot of so what questions. Can I say that? Anyway, so I think that is why we have you here. We like you to highlight some of your research and its relevance to tourism industry, in particularly. In China, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Professor Bahalis. The floor, the floor is yours. Thank you. Fantastic、uh, to be back in China.、Uh, I'm touring China this time. I started from Dalian, went down to Guilin, and now in Tianjin. And、um, for a long time, Tianjin,、um, Tianjin was trying to get me. To come to Nankai, and I say I'll come to Nankai when you celebrate something great. So you celebrate kind of years,、uh, and also you celebrate the big conference. And it's great to be here and share with you some of the latest developments in tourism and、uh, hospitality, and some of the research we do in Bomb University. And I'm also very grateful to Professor Kier because he already set up the scene for me by explaining a whole range of technologies. So I don't have. To do that、uh, again. Now, what I'm spending a lot of time doing is looking to how smart systems operate. And in China, in particular, you've got so many smart systems, so many sensors, so many cameras, so many different kinds of technologies that are collecting big data in real time, and you engage with a whole range of different. Um, uh, information and different stakeholders coming all together. So what I'm going to talk about is smart tourism, real-time marketing, and the latest te、uh, technology and the latest research I'm doing on nowness and also ambient tourism, because a lot of the technologies that we're using are going to change the way we operate in tourism. So what I'm saying is that what we used to do. In tourism, in the last ten years, will be dramatically different to what we'll be doing in the future. What we'll be doing in the future will be dramatically different from what we did in the past. And one of the main reasons for that is that the consumers are pushing us. You're all taking pictures of everything I say. Please, if you put it online, hashtag Bukhalis, because my mother keeps looking where I am every time, and said, "Where is my son speaking today?" So hashtag Bukhalis. But what happens is that consumers are looking after instant gratification. They would like a solution. They would, would like it now, and they would like that solution to be context-based, to understand what is happening around them, and actually provide a solution that will meet their requirements in real time. They like personalization, contextualization. And they like to co-create experiences, memorable experiences. And they like them now. And they like technology to be their friend and their supporter. So to know where's the best coffee around this campus, and get this coffee to come to them. The other thing that's becoming very important is、uh, technology coming before travel, during travel, and after travel. Because in the 80s and the 90s, when we were talking about technology, we were talking about the bit before. How can I do bookings? Now, increasingly, is how can I have technology that is coming with me and is helping me in real time, predicts what's going to happen, and gives me the best solution 
for my requirements in real time, and then sharing the uh, experience I had with a lot of other people afterwards. So smartness for me is really bringing the interoperability and interconnectivity of integrated technologies to re-engineer processes and services in order to produce innovative services, products and procedures towards maximizing the value of all. Now, for many years, we know that tourism is a network business. You cannot do it on your own. You've got a network of different organizations that they operate together. However, most of the systems operate in the silos, so you couldn't really interact with anything else. Now, what's the big difference is that we're going to optimize networks rather than individual businesses. And this is what smartness is doing, is bringing networks together to bring the, all those things together. To do that, you need networks for interoperability and interconnectivity. You need the Internet of Things and Internet of Everything. You need sensors and beacons. You need big data, uh, big data and data analytics. You need social media, web two, and user-generated content. And you need all these enablers to work together towards value co-creation and competition. Collaboration and competition at the same time. Competition. This is some of the latest research that we are publishing, which really look into how technologies bring disruption. And it's bringing disruption both at the micro level and the macro level. And brings a whole range of new different players and a new ecosystem that is going to change how tourism is operating. This is something that's coming on the general service management. It's going to be published very soon. But the key word here is disruption. What we used to know is different. Now, I've been in China for two weeks now. And the disruption is everywhere. I go to restaurants and they ask me to order. I cannot go there through a waitress anymore. I've got to scan it on WeChat, understand the application in Chinese, and order myself self-service ordering system on the application. Now, for my European standards, I couldn't really do this. So I'm having conversations. And, they, and the waitress are looking at me and say, ah, you're so behind technology in China, we're so ahead. And then I've got to pay with Alipay or WeChat Pay. And I don't have any of those. I still go around with R&Bs in cars. I like cars. And they look at me and say, where is this guy coming from? And the Chinese, when they come to London, they go Alipay. And the people in London are looking at them and say, huh? What's he doing? Because we are not paying with the, with the mobile phones still in Europe and many places around the world. You are very, very advanced and you found disruption. Uber, now what do you call it? DD? QQ or what do you call it? You've got all these things. Um, then I went somewhere recently and there's Sadu Sadu. Sadu Sadu. Plays music. Um, so you've got a lot of technology that's actually disrupting. Uh, it is disrupting everything we do. And disrupting in a way that unless you understand how this technology can actually help you, it cannot take us forward. The big problem is that a lot of people don't know how this technology can help them. And also the industry quite often does not connect the bits. Okay? Does not connect the bits. And I think this is where we're going to go and we're going to change. So this, um, we're looking to all the enabling technologies from 5G, RFID, artificial intelligence, mobile, applications, scripts, blockchains, to look into what kind of innovations we're going to have in the future. And then when we are bringing the supply chain on the one side and the demand requirements on the other side, and we're bringing the middle where we've got um, virtual reality, augmented reality, location-based services, and increasingly autonomous devices, that they're going to take over a whole range of, of, of things that are happening. I, I, I really like your scooters and when Ofo started in China operating with these bikes, conceptually it's a significantly different kind of way of operating. Because you don't own assets anymore, but you use them as and when you require them. But what those um, 
GPS enabled bikes and scooters and whatever mean is that you're going to have one nearby you. Not where the seller would like them to be, but where the demand requires them. It is conceptually and philosophically different in the way it operates, and that's why it's disruptive. Uh, this is from Korea. I went to Korea in Seoul recently, and I was looking to their emergency and crisis management operating systems in, uh, the, the, in, uh, in the city of Seoul. And these are all the indications they've got. And they get about 30,000 feeds to give them pixels from everywhere and control their city based on real-time data. Real-time data is the most critical bit that you see the difference in the future. Because planning and proactive um, the design is one thing, but getting real-time data and managing real-time data, I think, is revolutionary. They've got all kinds of indicators, and they've got all kinds of alerts. So if something goes wrong, immediately they've got an alert, and immediately they can do something about it. And this is my favorite thing. It's, it's looking at different... Uh, that is my favorite thing. It's looking at the bus lane, at the bus, at the bus route, and it's looking where each bus is, and looks into whether the bus is actually in a good, in a good condition, i.e. it has got good operational uh, conditions, or whether it's under stress. Whether it's red, it means under stress. Hello, Professor Bauer has just arrived. Ni hao. Um, so what you have here is a real-time bus service where you need to understand what, where is the pressure on the bus service. And if you've got bad, bad service here, that you can actually bring in another bus or you can do different things to improve um, the bus circulation at that particular time. This brings us to the next point, which is nowness and context-based services and real-time tourism. The day before yesterday, I had a nano holiday. I had about eight hours of holiday. So I decided to go downtown. But the weather was not good. The pollution was not good. And the services were not coming back to say to someone who doesn't know the city where to go. The day before, it was excellent. On the day I had free to go out, it was not so good. So, I have another 48 hours here. And I need to have the best services. So when I go away from Tanzin, I'll say I had the best experience and very memorable experience in my life. And I don't, I don't, I don't really need to know what's going to happen next week because I'll be in London. And the week after, I'll be in Greece. So every time, I need the information that I need now. So 2030 is really about nowness. It's really about understanding how can I support my user in this particular moment, in this particular location, in this particular time. We call it Sokomo and we call it real-time tourism. Real-time tourism means I'm bringing everybody from the tourism industry to meet everybody from the consumer side and means that we've got the social media context-based and mobile uh, um, information coming together to match in the best possible way demand and supply in real time. And that's difficult. And that's what's going to bring us to 2030, where all these technologies are going to help us to operate in real time. I don't need to talk about sensors in China. You've got face recognition everywhere. You've got cameras flashing. Everywhere I go around, I'm just smiling because there are people taking pictures of me. So I go, I walk around on the street or when I'm on the taxi, um, there's a camera looking at me, yeah? So everywhere I go, I smile because I know that there are, there are people taking pictures of me or machines taking pictures of me. And I know that it's um, uh, uh, face recognition. You've got a lot of different sensors for temperature, for humidity, for light, all of those things are collected. Increasingly, we'll have wearables. We'll have things that are happening on people's bodies, and they'll tell us what's happening in real time. Uh, we look into social media, and we understand what's happening on social media. So I can see on WeChat what is happening, what's coming out of this 
out of Israel. How many people are putting experience out there? And how people are saying stories? And how many people say Bukhalis have actually, is doing a fantastic presentation, I'm learning so much. Hashtag Bukhalis, hello mom. Yeah? And then you've got something that Brian Solis is called the conversation priest, where the conversation is happening wherever the conversation is happening. And right in the middle, we've got listen, engage, learn, and co-create. We listen in real time, we learn and engage in real time, and we co-create in real time. That's really difficult. Because responding in real time, it's quite, quite, quite difficult. But I think this is where we're going in 2030, is looking to how can we collect real time information, big data, using artificial intelligence and machine learning to understand very quickly what's happening in that place and provide a solution. That makes a difference. And ultimately, you as a consumer benefit from that, or you as a brand also benefit from that. So what we need to do is we need to look into value co-creation for every single different kind of user and understand how we can take these things forward. Gradually, we have got beacons and we're sending this information and people are collecting this information and can use them in their, in their vicinity. So this is the framework I'm working right now and it's a new publication that has not happened yet. Uh, but basically all the suppliers are creating all kinds of data. This data is going up on the cloud. It's analyzed by artificial intelligence machine learning. And we're working with value aggregators to create a storm of value that comes to the consumers. It's a storm of value that comes to the consumers and provide, provide benefits for them. And then it comes back again as feedback to the suppliers. Is this new? Is this new? No, it isn't. It's, we've always done that in tourism, right? In tourism, hospitality, in hotels, we've always done that. What is new here? What is new here is the timing. We used to put a menu out. We, look, we used to do questionnaires. We used to say, how many dishes have you sold from this thing? We used to analyze it. And then gradually we'll come back with some feedback. But this used to take two years, one year. Tourism statistics, when the China National Tourism Authorities bring out statistics, they're probably one year or two years old, right? That is a problem because it's historical data. What you really want is real-time data and what we can take forward and how can we take advantage of this. So the smartness is on the speed and the time. And that brings us to the next stage of, of um, of uh, smart solutions. Where you've got sharing economy, you've got autonomous vehicles, you've got artificial intelligence, big data, and real-time management. Smartness is not about technology. Smartness is really about people and leadership. The technology is the easy bit. We can have technology and we can have our engineers fixing things. What we do with this is a difficult thing. And we've got to prepare our people to actually understand what we do with that. And we need to have leadership. We need to have leaders to understand how they can take technology and create value. That gap between technology and value needs brains. And that's why the best students and the best universities, we're all doing research on this, to understand how we can create value out of technology. And then once you've done that, then you're looking to co-creation between economic actors, social actors, and technological actors. All of those people need to be coordinated together. And then you need to bring together all the smart innovation in terms of mobility, governance, economy, people, living, and environment to actually uh, improve and develop the competitiveness of the tourism industry. That is occupying my time for the last 30 years. Because this is really critical in bringing all of these things together and actually uh, maximize that. On the one side, you've got tourism companies. On the other side, you've got consumers. And you bring them here in the middle to have a personal encounter and create that personalized experience with the magic moment. This is a moment where you create magic. And if you create magic, you create value. People are coming back to you. And people engage with you. And people would like to, um, to develop new things. And all of that is based on real time. 
it's real time that really counts on all of those things. So this is a video I'm not going to play, but this is what Mario is doing in terms of looking into um, how they can create real time value and looking to what's happening around any of the Marriott hotels, understanding they are geo tag and time tag everything, so they understand what's happening around. And they've got five control rooms around the world that they call them M Live, and the M Lives are actually looking to what's happening around the world and create solutions in real time. So, what really engaged me is nowness, now. And now is based on location based mentions. Hashtag, sentiment analysis, trending topics, key, keyword tracking, competitors, and everything that's happening now. And whatever, if I understand now, if I understand that 800 people in this room, and understand that in about 40 minutes you'll all be hungry and looking for lunch, I can make sure that I'll have lunch for 800 people. And if I understand who are the people and what their allergies are and what they prefer and what they don't prefer, I'll, I'll have personalized lunch for 800 people. And I'll engage in real time with all these people. So this is the publication on this, so you can see a lot of the logic and a lot of the research we've done behind it. Real time is looking to wants and expectations. What do people want in terms of what's near me? Any recommendations? It doesn't work, can I help? Terrible service, complaints and then brings together a whole range of different touch points. Obviously, these Western touch points, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and things like that, but you've got WeChat, and you've got QQ, and you've got RRM, and whatever else you've got in China that are doing a similar kind of thing. So now let's say that in the past, we have competitive advantage based on two things. We have price or differentiation. Increasingly, Competitive advantage is going to come from time. And competitive advantage is going to come from instant gratification. I'm instantly gratifying the needs of my stakeholders and that maximizes the value from everybody on the ecosystem. So this is the, the things that we're doing right now. Looking to how we can maximize the um, the value for all, all our players in the ecosystem based on numbers. So the next stage is something I've just published about with ambient intelligence tools. It's going back to the technologies that you and me, uh, you, were, you were talking about. But imagine if everything is interconnected with everything and you can have predictive technology that is looking to what's going to happen next based on experience and based on a lot of parameters that we can actually program. We'll have solutions looking for the customers rather than customers looking for the solutions. This is fundamentally different. Solutions are looking for the customers rather than customers looking for the solutions. This is revolutionary. Ambient intelligence will introduce smart systems to everyday environment, propelling interconnectivity and interoperability of all systems, vehicles and, uh, and, vehicles and uh, devices through the internet of everything. Technical developments will be including artificial intelligence, machine learning, ambient connectivity through web and Wi-Fi, 5G, autonomous vehicles and robotics. And all of those things will be pushing a whole range of new products and services in interconnected markets that will create value in real time. It's based on mobile, pervasive and ambient technologies that they are portable, wireless network, location sensitive and secure. They are ubiquitous, interactive, interoperable, distributed, distributed and scalable. And they are embedded, context aware, uh, personalized, adaptive and anticipatory. They will anticipate your needs based on your context and based on your personal requirements and your history and your consumer behavior. And they'll come back to create a solution before you actually um, raise the need for the solution. 
we are going to get into a situation where everything is going to talk to everything. So cars will talk to each other. And cars will talk to everybody that is in, in, um, in their vicinity and coordinate with everybody. Then you have cars talking to robots and talking to drones. And then you have coordination between all of those things without human interaction. Any of you who is a computer scientist, you know what I'm talking about. The question is what's going to happen to humans and what's going to happen to tourism and what's going to happen, how we are going to change these things. We're going to have human-to-human -human interactions and we're going to have technology running that through a whole range of different combinations. And then we have ambient intelligence, where you have the Internet of Things, the Internet of Everything, 5G, RFID, mobile device and wearables, uh, applications, crypto chains and blockchains, sensors and beacons, pervasive computer gamification, artificial intelligence and machine learning, all working here instantly between all the different players to make sure that value is being co-created for everybody who is in the ecosystem. This is fundamentally different from everything we knew before. And I think this is really exciting. This excites me and this enables us to look into new solutions that will be coming in the future. Now, at this stage, I've got a lot of people who get really, really uh, worried and anxious and say, what about the human thing? And I say, smartness is not about technology. Smartness is about agility. So it's not about what technology you use, but how agile you are to manage it in the best possible way. And I always use this example. Some years ago, I was in uh, Hanzhou at the Handsome Blossom Water Museum Hotel. And my chambermaid left this note in my room. Said, dear Professor Bukhalis, that you want to speak tomorrow in order to better protect your throat, I specifically prepare for you a candy. And she left this candy there. This is the smartest thing that has ever happened to me. It's the same care that my mother would have done. They didn't use technology, but she used a lot of agility. She understood what the customer needed. She understood as a human being what will improve value. And she just did it. This is the smartest thing that ever, uh, has ever done, has ever been done to me in Kanjo Blossom Water Museum Hotel. A lot of these things are happening out of the lot of research that we're doing. Um, and this is the latest research that I'm using to, pre to create this, uh, uh, this presentation. My team back in Bournemouth University is working tirelessly when I'm going around delivering these speeches. And this is the real um, this is the real research that this is based on. Cecilia, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Johannes, for sharing your insights about all this year's research. So I'm quite impressed. Well, uh, as you know, the theme of the conference this year is education and the research. You have done a brilliant job, cover a lot of things on smart tourism and the research. I want to ask you one question. Okay, you can keep it short and sweet. How about that? Always. Okay, good, okay. Well, so all this technology happening, all these enhanced learning experiences, so how do you see all these disruptions of technology brought to our daily lives, like Xiaodu Xiaodu you just mentioned? What about educators? Are we going to lose our jobs? Are we going to be, you know, 
facing all kinds of threats. So that is also a very important theme of today's conference. Would you like to share with our audience? Thank you. Oh, oh sorry. Oh. Yeah. You want a short answer to this question? Well, I just Whoa. want you to make a comment on uh, okay. how the technology influencing the way we do okay. as educators on teaching and learning. I think it's a very big question, and I think that's a very interesting question. I think we're going to a situation where we co-create knowledge and excellence with our students. Now, university professors around the world and a little bit more in China, they are semi-gods. And they are telling the students what the students have got to learn. Right? We need to prepare for a situation where the students know more than the professor. The students have got the answers before the professor. And I see my, my job as a professor facilitating the learning of my students rather than teaching them. In fact, um, this slide, the last slide, it was put together by Yegen Sinarta that we did the real-time uh, real research together, and now we're going to the ambient intelligence. Yegen is an Indonesian girl who came to do the master's with me, and we spent a lot of time fighting. No, it's going to happen like that. No, professor, you don't understand. It's going to happen like that, because all my friends have got all this technology, and they're doing that, and they're doing that. We need, to, we need to understand that our students are digital natives. We are digital migrants. I got my first mobile phone when I was 30 years old. The kids now, the kids now, they're getting their mobile phones when they're six years old. So, we are going to a new situation where the university is not something that you'll come and you'll tell the students what to learn and memorize and come and write on the exam and say, Professor, do I memorize it right? To a place of knowledge co-creation where students, they learn from the professor, the professor learns from the students, the students learn from the other students, and all of them as a network, they operate and they go smart and they operate with society and we're going to society and we're looking to the real problems of the society and then we come back with solutions. So I think universities and learning is going to change dramatically. It will be much more international and much more global by nature. We will learn from all kinds of different kind of sources and we learn by coming together and fight over solutions and fight over new developments that are happening. And I think that's disruptive as well because the, 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 the teacher and the professor has to adapt to the new realities because otherwise the teacher and the professor will be irrelevant when the student knows more. Great. So this is a very, very interesting kind of um, area to develop. Thank you very much. You just made our day. I think we will still have a very good job. We'll still be able to facilitate the learning with the technology supported, enhanced learning and teaching environment. Do you agree? I agree. The facilitation is a big thing. Yes, yes. But it's a different way from what we do now. And right. we, need, we need to be self-critical of what we do now and actually evolve with the technology and evolve with all these things to be able to adapt to the new environment. Otherwise, we'll become irrelevant. Because all the information will be on Sadhu Sadhu. Sadhu Sadhu, what do I need to know about competitiveness and marketing? And Sadhu gives you the lesson. Coming from the best professor from around the world really? on that kind of thing. Very good. Very so good. Yeah. we need to adapt, develop, and move okay. forward. Thank you very much, thank Alice. You. So thank you very much. Thank Please. You.